Cool. Can you all hear me? Can we, can we about to hear this? Great. So I normally start this talk with a quote. And generally, it's kind of a bit buzzwordy, but it kind of gets the point across. So for B-Sides, I kind of wanted to start it with a question instead. I wanted to say, well, so what does Agent Smith from The Matrix, what does the Joker from Batman, and what does Darth Vader from Star Wars all have in common? And it's not the idea that they're orphan films. It's not the idea that they're all villains. It's the idea that they're all villains with motives and purposes. They all do what they do for a reason, whether that's enslaving humanity in the Matrix or building the Death Star in Star Wars. All of these bad guys are doing something for a reason. And then generally, the heroes in these films will use that motive, they'll use that purpose to destroy the villain or something along those lines. And that's kind of what offender profiling is about. It's about building a knowledge base on malicious actors. It's about understanding who the bad guys are so that we can better protect ourselves. So coming back to that quote, this quote is about preemptive security. It's about the idea of doing something now, spending some money now, spending some time now to help protect ourselves in the future. And offender profiling is a type of preemptive security. Offender profiling is all about building that knowledge base. It's all about building that bigger picture behind an attack so that we can better protect ourselves. I want to break today up into three main areas. I want to talk about what offender profiling is and why it's important. I want to talk about what already exists, some white papers, some research papers that use offender profiling. And then finally, I want to talk about where else we can use offender profiling, how we can use offender profiling in security operations, and some practical methods for doing that. Before I begin, though, who am I? Right? Well, my name's James Stevenson, and this time last year, I was a student at the University of South Wales studying computer security. Before that, I was a graduate, at Alert, uh, sorry, I was an intern at Alert Logic, a cloud security company, and these days, I'm a graduate in BT security. I've also run several websites, jamesstevenson.me and hackinginside.com, and I'm also on Twitter at underscore James Stevenson. But that's kind of the, the boring stuff, right? So going back to offender profiling, what is offender profiling? I keep talking about it, but what actually is it? As I keep saying, knowledge base, right? It's all about that knowledge base. And at a very high level, we can break that knowledge base down into three main areas. The first area is information on the target. You know, who is the target? The who and the what. Are they an individual, a group? Are they a government organization? And what was, uh, what was targeted? What asset was specifically targeted? To build that knowledge base, we also need some information on the attacker. Again, the who and the what. Who was the attacker? Again, were they an individual, a group? Were they state-sponsored? And what attack vector was used? Finally, to build that knowledge base, to build that profile, we need some general and overall information. And that's when did this attack occur and why did this attack occur? And it's all of that information that allows us to build that bigger picture. There's an example I like giving for offender profiling. And I'll be honest, I like giving it because it's simple. It's easy to get our heads around. It's the idea of a DOS attack. So let's say we're protecting a customer's network. And they're continually getting DOSed by a Scandinavian hacker group between the hours of 3 and 6 each day. We can tell our customers, OK, put extra load balancers in place at those times. And then for the rest of the day, use what you usually have. So here we're using offender profiling, preemptive security, and some general security techniques to help protect our customers. And that's kind of what offender profiling and attack profiling are all about. So that's what offender profiling is, but why is it important? Why do we need it? Well, this is a quote from the Los Angeles police chief. It's actually to do with predictive policing, but I think it describes offender profiling quite well. It's the idea that we're not getting more staff, we're not getting more money. We have to use what we have now effectively. And that's the same in security, because security is not the buzzword it once was. It doesn't have the endless budgets it once did. It's all about utilization, using what we have right now. So then if we can spend some money now, if we can spend some resources now using preemptive security, then that can help us protect ourselves from something exponential in the future. So that's what offender profiling is, and that's why offender profiling is important. But why is security important? Right? We wouldn't be here today if we didn't believe security was important. Well, this is a statistic from Have I Been Pwned. And if you don't know, Have I Been Pwned is kind of a massive online database of breached account credentials. You type your email address in, and it tells you if you've been part of a data breach. Now, this is the amount of compromised accounts that were listed 
on Have You Been Pwned on the 12th of the 2nd, 2018. And this number is really interesting, right? It's really interesting for two reasons. It's interesting because, well, that's a massive number. But it's also interesting because it shows us security isn't going anywhere. It shows us security is in it for the long haul. Because as long as we have things, we have things that can be broken. And as long as we have things that can be broken, we have things that need protecting. So that's why offender profiling is important. That's why security is important. But what already exists? What are some examples of white papers, examples of research papers that use offender profiling? Well, this is a white paper by Mandiant. It's probably the first white paper I've ever read, and it's getting old these days. But it's on APT1, a Chinese hacker group uh, that attack Western organizations believed to be state-sponsored. This white paper uses offender profiling because it delves into who the malicious actors are. It goes into their motives. It goes into their attack patterns. And all in all, it builds a bigger picture on who they are and what they do. We've got another white paper here. This one is by F-Secure. This white paper goes into the Callisto group, and again, it's quite similar. It looks at who they are, looks at their motives, looks at their attack patterns, and again, it builds that bigger picture so that we can better protect ourselves. A final white paper here, this one is slightly different. This one is by McAfee, and this is McAfee's annual threat report. This white paper goes into a whole range of different malicious actors, different motives, different attack patterns, but again, builds a bigger picture on all of them. So we can probably start seeing a pattern here, right? Because offender profiling is all about that bigger picture. It's all about using the information from that bigger picture to protect us. So there's some examples of offender profiling in, in research and white papers. But where else can we use offender profiling? Well, as I said earlier, I worked in a security operations center. I worked in a company called Alert Logic for around about a year. And at a very high level, we can break a security operations center down into two main elements. We have our customer and we have our SOC, our security operations center. Our customer will have an IDS, an intrusion detection system, a WAF, web application firewall, or some sort of logging system. They'll then send those logs to our SOC. In our SOC, we'll have an analyst who will review those logs. They'll say, well, what's actually happening here? Is this a false positive? Is this a false negative? They'll then write up some form of feedback and send that back to the customer. And that works really well. We get this kind of really good feedback loop. We get logs, analysis, feedback. And as I said, that works really well. Where that doesn't work, however, is generally we're only ever looking at one attack at a time. We might be looking at multiple events or multiple incidents, but generally we're only ever looking at one attack at a time. And the problem with that is we're not looking at the bigger picture, the bigger picture of which we said was so important for offender profiling. So the question is then, could we implement offender profiling into security operations? Well, yes, we could. It's been done. One of the ways we do this is by latching on a framework to what already exists, by latching on a framework for offender profiling into our security operation center. So we take our logs as usual. We analyze them as usual. But then we also start bucketing that information. We say, well, this attack is related to an attack you had a month ago. This attack is related to an attack you had a week ago. And this attack is related to another attack another one of our customers has had. And then when we send that analysis back to our customers as usual, we can send this bucket of information. We can allow our customers to understand what's happening. We can allow our customers to build that bigger picture and to build that knowledge base. And that's really what's important. So this is Alice. Alice is a security analyst for an up and coming security startup. Alice manages a small team of security analysts and it's their job to deal with incidents from their customers as they come in. And that generally works really well. Alice's job is then to action those incidents. So maybe that's writing up some feedback, or maybe that's um, remoting in or calling customers. As I said, generally that works really well. Where that doesn't work really well is when Alex's team gets swamped by incidents. Because the way these attacks are prioritized is based on time. So the sooner an attack comes in, the higher a priority has. So Alice has done some research, and she's looked into ways that she can prioritize attacks in her team's security operation center based off elements outside of time. So how can these attacks be prioritized, not just on the time they come in? And these are the methods that we're going to be talking about for the rest of today. So after Alice has implemented these methods, these uh, security techniques, 
her team can now action these objectives based on their risk. So high risk attacks no longer get lost in a flurry of lower risk attacks. So you're probably thinking, okay, James, that's great. Surely it's time to dive into some of these methods for offender profiling. Well, not quite. Before we do any of that, we have to do something I like to call method zero for offender profiling. And method zero is all about understanding what we're protecting. Because at the end of the day, we can't protect what we don't know. So as I said earlier, I own a website, jamesstevenson.me. That's an asset. That's something I'm protecting. That's its name. Well, it's classification. Is it high risk? Is it low risk? Its description, well, it's a WordPress website running an email server backend. Owner, custodian, that's myself. And finally, the user, that's the public. That's, that's you and I. And again, the reason why we build these asset profiles, the reason why we build these information classifications is to better protect our assets. Let's say we have two assets, a high-risk asset and a low-risk asset. If we have a malicious actor targeting both of these assets, which one do we prioritize? Well, we'll probably prioritize the high-risk asset, right? Because that one is intrinsically of a higher risk. And we'll see how this comes into play later on. But for now, we just need to know that to better protect our assets, we need to know what they actually are. So moving on to our first real method for offender profiling. This method looks at the frequency of attacks. And I'm a fan of the name of this method because it actually describes what it's doing. And it's all to do with plotting the frequency of attacks. And the way we do this is we take a time frame. So here I think we've got the time frame of around about a month. And whenever we see an attack from a specific malicious actor to a specific asset, we increment its frequency. It's not as simple as adding one. There's some maths behind it, but really that's all we need to know. And if we don't see an attack from a specific malicious actor to a specific asset, we decrease the significance, we half-life it. So what we end up getting is these peaks and these troughs. And that's really useful because that then allows us to compare malicious actors. So here we can see two different malicious actors. We can see a malicious actor from China in kind of a light blue, and we can see a malicious actor from Russia in a red. And we can see that this malicious actor from China continues to attack the asset throughout this time frame. While the malicious actor from Russia attacks, stops, attacks, stops, and continues. So again, if this was the only information we had, which of these attacks would we prioritize? Well, it would probably be the malicious actor from China, right? Because that one is far more frequent. It's far more pressing on us or our customers. So moving on to our second method for offender profiling, our second method that we can use to prioritize or compare or understand attacks. This method looks at risk. It says, what is the risk of this attack to my or my customer's organization? And the way we do this is we ask several questions and rate them with a score between 0 and 10. For those of you that know the OWASP risk rating methodology, this is super similar. So we then rate those questions, questions like complexity of attack, ease of discovery, ease of exploit, loss of confidentiality, loss of availability, kind of loss of integrity, and so on. And again, we rate them between 0 and 10. We then take an average of those scores, times them together, and get our overall risk. That overall risk score will be a number you know, between 0 and 100. With the higher the number, the higher the risk. So again, if we had two attacks, one with a risk of 70 and one with a risk of 30, which of those attacks would we prioritize? Well, it would be the risk of 70, right? Because that one, is, again, is intrinsically higher. It intrinsically has a higher risk. Moving on to our third method for offender profiling. So here, I really didn't want to talk about the cyber kill chain. Some people love the cyber kill chain, and some people hate the cyber kill chain. For those of you that don't know, the cyber kill chain is a method by Lockheed Martin for analyzing the life cycle of malware exploitation. Generally, it works really well. It has several areas like reconnaissance, weaponization, actions and objectives, but it's quite overused. It's generally used across security when really it should only be used in deploying malware. So for this example, we're going to be using a far more generic kill chain model for computer security, a model that covers five areas that a malicious actor might undergo as part of an attack. So sections like researching the target, testing infrastructure, actively attacking, actions, which is doing the thing, and then finally covering tracks and planting backdoors. And you might be thinking, well, James, that's great and all, but what does that have to do with offender profiling? And the reason we do this 
is so we can then pin these categories to our malicious actors. We can say, well, at this time and date, malicious actor A was in the research stage. Well, at this same time and date, malicious actor B was in the actions stage. So again, if that was the only information we had, which of those attacks would we prioritize? Well, it would be the malicious actor in the actions stage, right? Because that one is further along in their attack. The malicious actor in the research stage may never get to that stage. We've gone to our penultimate method for offender profiling. This method can be the simplest or it can be the most complex because it's all to do with asking <sighs> questions. And the simple answer is we just might not know the answer to them. We ask questions on the target and questions on the attacker. Questions like, well, who was the target? If we, well, we probably do know, but if we know. Are they an individual? Are they a company? Are they a government organization? And questions are like, well, why were they targeted? Was this part of a massive reconnaissance attack? Or was this part of a singular spear phishing attack? And then finally, we ask the question of, well, why was this organization targeted? Why was company A targeted and not company B next door targeted? We then also ask questions on the attacker, again, if, if we know them. Questions like, well, who was the attacker? Were they an individual, a government organization? Were they state-sponsored? And do we know their intent? Was it malicious? Was it financial? Was it hacktivism? And then finally, did anything happen leading up to this attack? Was there anything on social media? Was there anything on the news? Did we receive any threats? Were there any new laws or legislation passed? And it's the answers to all of these questions that allow us to answer this final question. And that's with the knowledge we have now, with the knowledge we have on our target, and the knowledge we have on our malicious actor, is this attack likely to continue? Because building a knowledge base is great. Looking at the bigger picture is great. But understanding if we are still at risk is far more important. So moving on to our final method for offender profiling, method five. This method is called method five, but really it could be called method 0 0.5. Because instead of looking at offender profiling or attack profiling, it looks at offender categorizing. It asks the question, well, can we create a sub-unique identifier, a sub-unique naming convention for our malicious actors that we can instantly glean information from? The way it does this is it breaks that name into four main areas. It takes the location the malicious actor was first seen or is most commonly seen, the date the malicious actor was first seen, the risk score, which is the number we derived earlier on. So that's the number between zero and 100. And then finally, the last octet of the first seen or most common IP address. And that just gives it its kind of sub-unique identifier. And again, the reason why we do this is so we have a naming convention for our malicious actors. Now, we could use IP addresses. We could use hashes. We could use MAC addresses. This is just one example of something we could use. So we've gone through what offender profiling is and how we can use it. We've gone through why it's important. We've gone through examples of offender profiling in research and white papers. We've also gone through offender profiling and attack profiling in security operations. The real takeaway of this talk, though, comes in around the next 30 seconds or so. And it's inspired by this quote. Because intrusion analysis, security analysis, network analysis, they're far more than the tools we use. They're generally about understanding something. In some cases, that might be about understanding an attack. And when that's the case, offender profiling shows us that every attack is orchestrated. Every attack has a motive and a purpose. And in better understanding that motive and purpose, we can better protect ourselves. So thank you all for your time. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask me now. Come find me afterwards. Or as I said, I'm also on Twitter at underscore James Stevenson. And again, thanks to all the organizers as well. Thanks, everyone.